lymphedema basically is this abnormal accumulation of lymph fluid, and it can occur anywhere in the body. When we're talking about lymphedema as it relates to breast cancer, um, we're looking at the, um, the lymph nodes in the underarm, and they make you may have lymphedema uh, in your arm, in your chest, in your upper back, um, due to either disease being present in the lymph nodes in the underarm or from surgery, lymph nodes being removed or radiation. So um, the lymph fluid that is in your arm, in your chest, in your upper back, uh, that all goes, that is transported to the lymph nodes in your underarm, and that's where that fluid is filtered. So when there is radiation or surgery or disease present in that area, it causes a slowdown in the transport of the lymph fluid. And that's when you start to see swelling build up in the arm or the breast or, or the back. So there are two types of lymphedema. There's primary lymphedema and secondary lymphedema. Uh, primary lymphedema is hereditary. Uh, people are, are born with it, may not always occur at birth, may occur later on. Um, when we're talking about breast cancer related lymphedema, that's a secondary lymphedema. So the lymphatic system originally is intact um, and the lymphedema occurs as a result of, uh, of the disease or the treatment of the disease. The signs and symptoms, if it can be caught early, if people understand what lymphedema is and when they're starting to feel it, it starts with just a heaviness. Um, your rings may not fit right. Your sleeves are leaving indentions on your skin. Um, just even a heaviness, a tightness, um, a discomfort in the arm or chest. Um, ideally, that's when you would love to see somebody and get them started on lymph drainage, get them in compression, get everything moving, because that's the early stages. Mm -hmm. um, in my experience, it's usually not indicated or not acknowledged until there's truly swelling, swelling that doesn't go away, swelling that's there. And now the whole limb has flared up into a whole edema. And sometimes that happens even just because of the surgery or the radiation where the swelling just doesn't ever go away. And so anytime that there's swelling that's just there and whether it's an actual swelling where, look, my arm is swollen, or if it's just that tightness, heaviness, stiffness, discomfort in the limb, that's when you're experiencing lymphedema and should have it checked out. And I developed also the cording that you can kind of see sometimes that develop between like, um, it literally looks like a spider web, like a little long elastic cord. Is that related at all to lymphedema or is the cording something separate? They say that that can be related to the lymphatic vessels and that the lymphatic vessels are tight and getting tighter. And so you see it in the cords that are there. Mm -hmm. And so it is kind of all related. It's not exactly your lymphedema, but when it's dealing with the post-surgery um, cancer with the different node dissections, that they are related. And oftentimes lymphedema treatment with stretching and just therapy helps to improve that as well. I also kind of, and I'm going to say this a little laughingly, where if you don't have lymphedema, I feel like it's something that we're always trying to manage to ensure that we prevent it or don't get it. And then once you have lymphedema, you're managing it to make sure that you don't get these flare-ups that Candace was just describing. Yeah, that, that's a great, sort of the million, million dollar question. And I'm sure uh, my, my colleagues, Fallon and Candace will agree with me. Um, the reality is, uh, well, first and foremost, I think the word prevention, I tend to steer people away from because prevention for two reasons. One, prevention implies that there is something you can do to make it never happen. And unfortunately, that's just not true. So we tend to use the word the risk reduction um, because we don't have 100% control over whether or not somebody, somebody develops lymphedema. The other piece I don't like about the word prevention is it implies that it's your fault, um, is that, you know, there's, there's lots we do know, but there's a whole lot we don't know about lymphedema and why it happens. So, so risk reduction is really the word that I tend to use. Um, and I think it's getting used more and more uh, with colleagues and in the literature as well. So with respect to reducing your risk, um, it's a double barrel question because there's, there's some good evidence for some, some absolutely known risk factors. And then there's a lot of debate with the rest. And the debate has to do with those long lists that you introduced to begin, at the beginning. So what we do know from the evidence, what has been shown pretty with solid evidence, is there are some main risk factors are one, being overweight, so high body mass index or BMI. So really encouraging people in terms of how you can reduce that risk to maintain a good body weight or get to a good body weight. The second one is infection. 
um, a specific type, um, actually, let me back that up, specific type of infection in the at-risk area, that's really important. Um, so maybe we need to back up after this question and just define that. I think that's important. Um, so if you develop an infection in the at-risk area, um, cellulitis is one of these types of infections, which is an infection in the skin that does increase your risk of developing lymphedema. So what people can do to minimize that risk is to have good, what we talk about is good skin care. So if you get cuts, any scrapes, um, doing your best to keep it clean, hand, soap and water does fine. If it starts to look a little concerning, polysporin, if it does start to look like an infection, I call that the do not pass go. Um, you need to get some medical attention on that quite quickly. Um, and the third one is about, it has to do with staying strong and staying mobile. So Candace alluded to this a little bit when she was talking about the axillary recording, is that we do know that if women um, have lost mobility due to scar adhesions from the surgery and or they're weak, um, that that can predispose them uh, from a lymphedema risk. So that sort of gets into some of those things that we hear about not doing repetitive or heavy activities, which is bogus. But if you are staying strong, staying uh, or getting stronger, those repetitive or heavy things shouldn't be stressful to the body. So those are the three things we do know for sure from the literature. All the other things, and I'm sure Fallon and Candace might want to jump in on this because this is a big question, right, with a big answer, is that laundry list. Those laundry lists of do's and don'ts that really, I think, just instill fear in women. Um, and we are working really hard to start to take that fear away. So we know that um, staying strong, staying flexible helps to minimize your risk. These things about air travel, it's just not backed in the literature right now. Um, the idea that air travel does increase your risk and we can have a healthy conversation about this because I think it's worthwhile. Um, other things I know that have been in the list, they talk about extremes of heat, hot tub saunas. Again, it's not backed in the literature. Um, I certainly do see women who have lymphedema and that flares things up. So I think there, there is an impact on the lymph system for sure. But at the moment, we don't have good evidence one way or the other to say for sure. Um, I think those are probably the biggies and the myths in the past about, I'm probably forgetting something off the top of my head. But so the short answer is healthy body weight, um, minimize risk of infections, stay mobile and stay strong. Those are the three things we absolutely can control to help minimize the risk. Or even if I could jump in, because even the primary and secondary lymphedema, for them to be differentiated. I think the literature on that is starting to blur those lines a little bit where do people have a predisposition to lymphedema? Do people have yeah. some sort of lymphatic backup, some sort of lymphatic complication that there's no way of knowing until something happens to the system. And then suddenly you have a problem and one person, you, you could have two people who present the exact same way. And I mean, short of being identical twins or something, you still don't know what that makeup is underneath in the lymphatics. There's no way to actually get in there and see like a lymphatic system. And that's the system that makes us all unique. So you can do everything 100% right and still end up with lymphedema. And there's really no way of knowing. And actually, even with mine, I'm finding the longer I'm treating lymphedema, even with your breast cancer and stuff, you're getting people who may experience lower body lymphedema where it's in the legs, but they have a cancer, a breast cancer history, but it's 20 years ago, 15 years ago, like a long time ago, but other things in life, whether it's like a venous insufficiency or just other related health complications where now, now you're experiencing lymphedema and it's not the lymphedema you're expecting it to be. And so every person really being unique and knowing what's going on with everyone is important because that contributes to those risk factors, contributes to those whatever trigger it's going to be that triggers a person individually, which sometimes may be air travel, which may be heat, which may be excessive cold, which can be a million different things, but we don't know until we know more about that individual person and that individual's history and their system. Um, are there other, th like, is that a myth about the, the, the manicures and um, like needles and blood yeah. pressure? Or I see some head nods. Like, yeah. what's going on there? <laughs> Yeah, so you do want to avoid any tourniqueting on the, the arm that's at risk. So yes, unless it's an emergency and that will trump everything, you really do want to try to avoid having the blood pressure, um, you know, um, any 
pricks, um, needles. Um, if you can avoid it, it is better to avoid it. Um, you know, just to piggyback on the conversation too, there, there are some, some simple things that can be done. I always say a lot of the um, risk reduction practices are things that we should be doing anyway, you know, preventing burns. So when you're going outside, just making sure that you have sunscreen, that you do reapply it often, um, you know, insect repellent to avoid mm -hmm. getting, um, you know, a bug bite on your affected arm. Um, so, you know, I, I agree. It's really about, you know, keeping, keeping your arm as healthy as possible. Um, and just being mindful of your, of your arm. If you're um, cooking, like wear oven mitts, <laughs> you know, things that you should be doing anyway, but you'll just be a little extra cautious. Uh, and these things, they do, they make a difference too. Um, in terms of manicures, uh, you know, the reason people say avoid manicures, which, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't often tell people to avoid them just to be cautious um, and perhaps bring your own tools so that you know what's being used is, is clean. Um, I do, I do advise people to avoid having cuticle work done because that often, you know, there's cuts or even, um, you know, even when the cuticles are pushed back. So just, mm -hmm. you know, that's my, my advice. Um, also, I tend to find people who've had lymphedema for a while tend to know their triggers too. Um, I don't think it's one size fits all for everybody. You know, some people um, may have a glass of wine and they know that's going to trigger them because it dehydrates them. Um, you know, so, so for some people it is flying and maybe it's um, you know, maybe it's not the actual changing cabin pressure, but it's eating saltier foods when you're traveling or, you know, doing um, a lot of extra lifting that, that you hadn't been doing, that you weren't prepped for. Um, so it's, you know, things that, that can kind of be modified. But I think also just knowing that um, you may also start to get a feel for what your triggers are and that can help to and so I will go speaking from my own experience, you know, maybe six or six to eight weeks in a row to get the lymphatic massage, but then there'll be like months at a time where I don't go because I'm managing it myself at home. And she says, um, you know, in my case, because I'm being incredibly proactive there, it's not like I'm going to wake up one day and have this exacerbated arm that I'm just going to wake up and turn over and be like, oh my gosh, what happened? Right. And so I want to kind of talk about that because I think sometimes we get into our heads a little bit that it's all or nothing and that there is, you know, and even as Candace, you're mentioning, like if we can identify these symptoms and understand at stage zero, how we can then prevent it from becoming stages two, three, four, et cetera, and being larger. So now that we know about some of the symptoms too, and I also think it's interesting that the lymphedema can also build up in the chest area and also on the back. Does someone want to talk a little bit about these other areas? I know my mind just goes straight to the arm because that's what is infected on me, but I do hear stories from women who are looking for specific like bras and garments or other things for compression on their chest as well. So it comes down to what's called what we term watershed lines. So, and these are imaginary lines. If you would imagine an imaginary line vertically through your belly button front and back and across through your belly button front and back that effectively divides your, your torso into four quadrants. So front and back being one quadrant together. So you have two upper quadrants and two lower quadrants. When we're talking in the case of today, breast cancer, most of the time, it, almost always, it is the axillary nodes or the armpit nodes that have been either a dissection um, or impacted through surgery or radiation. So we know that, and I'll just say right for the sake of this chat, so the right armpit lymph nodes drain fluid from the entire right arm, but also the right torso quadrant. So that means the right sort of chest, breast area down to the belly button, and the right upper back, including the armpit area. So everything below the collarbone to, the, to those watershed lines. So that Yes, it's much more common for lymphedema to occur in the arm, but it is not uncommon for it to occur in the breast. Really common, I find, in the armpit or a lot of women, lower my camera here, a lot of women sort of talk about this area back here is a really common space and the upper back as well. So any of, any of that area in the quadrant is at risk of developing lymphedema. 
the uh, first technique I was told was the breath, right? And trying to do some abdomen work to make way for the lymph fluid to move out of the, the arm area and through these various quadrants as well. So that's really helpful. When we always like to look at the comprehensive decongestive approach is the way it's coined. That's the gold standard of treatment. And so you want to look at the entire person. And so usually manual lymph drainage is the best as far as getting your system going, getting everything going. That's the massage technique where it stretches the skin. You can have it done and then usually we'll educate on self-stim techniques, which is your diaphragmatic breathing, different things that you can do to stimulate your system. Um, There's some research out there on dry brushing and just um, different rollers and stuff that you can use to try and help promote the lymphatic fluid and do that kind of stuff at home. You want to get into a good compression garment and that's where there's different levels of compression depending on how severe your lymphatic issues are. And so if it's early stages, you can get into a decent compression garment to provide enough support and then prevent anything from going further. Depending on what stage of lymphedema you're in and how far it is gone, you may need to start with wrapping or bandaging in order to get the fluid down and then get you into a compression garment to maintain that level Mm -hmm. because you don't want to stay enlarged and and congested with a large limb. If we can get that down, get everything moving and then get you into a garment, that would be better and more appropriate. And then you do always want to add exercise. And that's where that repetitive motion, repetitive exercise, you do want to keep moving. You want to get everything moving as best as you can. You want to maximize range of motion. You do want to do some things repetitively in order to build strength, but they always say to start slow and build up. And that's where I think people get into trouble where sometimes if they paint a room, if they go raking leaves, it's not something that you do every day. And if you're not moving around and exercising enough to jump into an activity that is now maybe more strenuous than what you're used to, your response to that strenuous activity isn't like, it's comparable to if you haven't gone to the gym for a long time and then you go back to the gym and everything hurts, but you did something that shouldn't have caused an inflammatory response, but did because you're more sensitive and then your lymphedema triggers and you have a little bit more of a problem, but you do want to do repetitive exercise, low weight, more repetition, just to build and strengthen and keep moving is a good thing for everybody genuinely and to keep everything going so that you aren't triggered as often so that you can go and do the things that you want to do. And it's not a problem for you. You know, I feel like we know the golden rules to like eat healthy and move the body and exercise, but it's so much easier said than done, especially when some of the aromatase inhibitors or tamoxifen pills that we're on are making our joints hurt. We're mm-hmm. stiff we're fatigued and, you know, it sounds counterintuitive, but we know also that exercising is probably the best bet to fight some of the fatigue as well. Mm-hmm. Um, can you dispel some of the myths? I know Candice, you were just also talking a little bit about the light impact and the, the weights. I think some of us also are running around with this fear of, I can't lift up a gallon of milk. I'm scared to lift up my child. You know, is there mm-hmm. um, some, some guidelines around what the the weight bearing should actually be? Yes, absolutely. Um, And yes, it used to be, you know, 10 plus years ago that surgeons did advise people um, not to lift more than a gallon of milk. um, And that probably predisposed a lot of people to injury and then worsened lymphedema. Um, So there, uh, there was a a large study that came out called the PAL trial by Katie Schmidt, um, a few years ago. And what that looked at, it looked at two things, people who had lymphedema and people who were at risk risk for lymphedema. Um, And she gave everyone a a strength training program. Uh, And what that program was, was starting out very lightweight, zero to one pound, and then every six weeks, increasing the weight by one pound. Um, And what they found was that people who were at risk, there was no greater incidence of developing lymphedema and people who already had lymphedema who did the strength training, it didn't worsen the lymphedema. Uh, and some of the participants went up to, you know, quite a significant amount of weight. I won't even say like a hundred pounds, um, but they were, you know, they were, they were trained for it. Uh, and it was starting off very you know, lightweight, and it was very gradual. Um, So that's what I generally counsel people on exercise. 
It just needs to be gradual and progressive. And if you're doing something, and also you, you need to be wearing your garments when you're exercising too. Um, people often find too, you know, they may be doing an exercise and then maybe the next day that they, they're a bit more swollen. Okay, well then, you know, maybe that was a little bit too much for you. Maybe you fatigued during that exercise. So taper back next time. So, it, you know, it's not always an all or nothing. Um, if, if you do something and you find it doesn't quite agree with you, modify it the next time. Yeah, I just wanted to add on to what Fallon said because I it's great. That was a great explanation. That trial was a really good game changer for giving us some backing as to how we, how we uh, counsel clients on, on exercise. Just two things I, I think that to make it easier to remember is I always say to women, low and slow. Start low weight progress slowly. It's an easy way to remember it because a lot of women get stuck on numbers and are worried about when they can progress. So low and slow seems to be an easy thing for women to remember. And the other one, and, and sorry, Fallon, if I'm misinterpreting what you were saying. So Fallon talked about wearing uh, garments when exercise. Um, I, I, for me, at least based on, and I, I'm going to assume that's probably what Fallon means is if you have lymphedema, if you're at risk of lymphedema, you do not need to be wearing a garment. Right. I, so mm -hmm. yeah, yep. I just, and yep. I figured that's what you meant, but I just wanted to clarify that because that is one of those misconceptions yep. is that Thank women you. think they, yeah. yeah, no problem. They just think they need to be wearing compression when they're exercising, when they're at risk. And that's just not true. So I just wanted to clarify that as well. And um, Beth, do you want to talk a little bit about like the different types and styles of what these garments are and how they work? Yeah, sure. So it, it really depends on where your lymphedema is. Um, in terms of how we decide with garments. Uh, so there are there's single pieces that go from the wrist up to the shoulder. There are two pieces. So they have the gauntlet, like you said, the compression goes to the knuckles and, and hooks around the base of the thumb uh, and a sleeve. Or you can have a one piece, it's all one piece put together. Or you can have another two piece, which is the gloves. The, what the gloves do, is they leave the fingertips free. So you're still able to type, to pick things up. Um, and those ones are reserved for people who have swelling in the fingers. Mm -hmm. So there's typically no real reason why we would suggest, there, there's always exceptions to those rules. Uh, but if, if there's no lymphedema in the hand whatsoever, um, it depends on the client. Sometimes I'll say, go from the wrist up only, or sometimes we will put a gauntlet on it first just to make sure that we're not causing a problem into the hand. Um, but, so those are the main garments for daytime. And within those daytime garments, there's sort of two categories, if you will. There's off the shelf, which is knit, what's called a circular knit. So it, it, and it becomes a little bit stretchier. And the other type is, an, is a custom and it's a flat knit. And what I mean by that is they literally knit it flat and then they bring it around and create a seam. And that fabric is also a bit of a stiffer fabric. It's a, effectively a better container. It offers better compression, but it's a more expensive garment. It, because it's a custom garment, it takes a little bit of time to get it. Uh, so there, there's pros and cons to them both. And that certainly would be a conversation that you'd have with your therapist and or your fitter. And then the nighttime garments are, not everybody needs a night garment. So some people do need as close to 24 seven compression as possible. Not everybody does. And there's multitude of night garments. And so it's sort of probably a bit too long for this conversation, but I had one client who once said, it's like a glorified oven mitt. And I love that because a lot of them are. So if you picture what those old fashioned oven mitts were, those quilted, um, a lot, there's different versions for that. And then there's all sorts of other things that we can use to play if you want with the specificity and what's actually going on in someone's limb. Yeah. So lots of options. There's bras, vests, there's all sorts of stuff. It just depends on where your swelling is and how much compression you need. You know, when someone is not used to these terms, we're talking about like bandages and our minds can go anywhere. So if you can give us an idea of what some of the wrappings are and the techniques and what the goals of transitioning from maybe you're doing the garments during the day and maybe doing some bandaging and wrapping at night, what um, that combination could look like and how the wrappings are supposed to help and move the fluid around. Yeah, um, lymphedema bandaging uses short stretch compression bandages. And so that's important because a lot of people think bandaging and they get their ACE wraps out and they're high stretch and you're really not getting the same compression that you would from a short stretch bandage. It's not the same thing. And so 
really with bandaging, you have a lot more flexibility. You can go from um, your fingertips to your axilla and do all sorts of things with that. And so there are finger bandaging to get the fingers if the fingers are involved. And again, depending on what it looks like and how people are and how their swelling is presenting and how much swelling is around. Um, but you're usually to start out and get everything going, you're starting with your fingers. Um, and that's a perfect example of the finger bandaging. And then there's a liner that you put on to protect the skin. And skin care is always very important too, to make sure that you're using your moisturizer and keeping everything clean and that you're protecting against any cuts or acknowledging any cuts or open areas or any irritations so that you're using the right ointments that the skin is doing well. Um, and you do your liner to protect the skin further. And then usually there's cotton or foam, depending on the severity of the fluid that you're trying to move. And so then you put that down because that's actually what's helping to move the fluid. And then the short stretch bandages go over that. And so usually there's different widths on your short stretch bandages. And so they go anywhere from six centimeter to eight to 10 centimeter. And you start with the smallest one at closest to the fingertips. And then as you work up, they get bigger. So then you're creating a gradient of fluid movement up the limb in order to decongest and get everything back to more of a normal symmetrical size. It just feels like you're in like a cast almost, right? Like a compression, I mean, not as, not as strong as a cast, but like a, a wrap, right? And I was like, okay, do I just put it here? Do I not move my arm? Should I use it? And they were like, oh, you should definitely use it. Like we want you to use your arm because it's that natural movement that you're using every day that's actually creating this like pumping sen sensation yeah. to move the fluid out of the affected area and throughout your body. We don't want you to baby it. We don't want you to not move it. And, oh, I'm bandaged and here it is and I'm not gonna do anything with you. We want you to actually engage that limb more so and try and move and engage and use it for grasp, use it for your ADL, use it for anything that you want to do so that all that fluid does move and just it's supporting the skin to get everything out of there. So that's really important to, to exercise, to do more with your arm in the wraps than you would do otherwise yeah. and start even those exercise programs and the gradient and the strengthening and all of that with that on, because that'll support you and actually help everything move better. Before we get to the Q&A portion, Phelan, I would love to ask, you know, we have this big picture now of what lymphedema is, what the symptoms are, some of the um, measures we can take for risk reduction strategies, and then if we have it to understand the, the exercises and options for healing. I would love to know, like when you're meeting with a patient, what are some of the questions an informed patient should bring with them? I feel like I'm such a big note taker. So when I'm coming into a doctor's office, I want to say like, here's my list of questions I need answered. But lymphedema can be so new and, you know, such a new term for us. What are some things that the patient should be asking? And especially if we're interviewing maybe two or three or getting different opinions from people, what should we be looking out for when identifying who our therapist should be? Um, first and foremost, when you're seeking lymphedema therapy, it should be done by a certified lymphedema therapist. Um, any, any PT or OT uh, can can treat lymphedema, but you want um, a CLT, a certified lymphedema therapist um, who has gone through the, the 135 hour training um, and you know the evidence-based training. So first and foremost, make sure that um, you're seeing a CLT. Um, I think it's important to know uh, the anatomy and the physiology of lymphedema and the lymphatics so that you have an understanding of um, why your arm or breast or, or back is, is swollen and what you need to do and why you need to do what you need to do in order to, to reduce it. Uh, you know, going over the risk reduction, um, you know, what can you do uh, in, in order to um, try and prevent flare-ups? Um, you know, some things are, are modifiable, other things are not. Um, and, and what the treatment plan entails, uh, you know, like Candace was talking about, um, you know, there's, um, there's two components to compression. One is a treatment phase and one is a maintenance phase. Um, not everyone may need, depending on the severity of the lymphedema, not everyone needs the multi-layer compression bandaging. Um, so just finding out, you know, what your treatment plan looks like. And along those lines too, about finding, you know, your, um, 
what was it, the CL CLT. Um, mm-hmm. If we are starting an exercise program, are there actual um, gym trainers that have experience or knowledge about lymphedema? So when we are going in and trying to start a workout program that we could talk about this or am I just making this up? Yeah, no, that's a great, uh, that's a great question. And um, I think it depends on um, the center where you're being treated. A lot of large academic centers um, like Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, I believe Johns Hopkins does this does this as well, um, have integrative medicine centers with uh, exercise physiologists or trainers um, that may be trained in lymphedema. Um, But I think that it is unique. Um, You know, what I also will do too, if um, someone is working with a trainer, I'll have a conversation with them too. So I think that that's definitely something, yeah, you can always ask your PT if, if they would, or OT, you know, if they would speak with, with your personal trainer and talk about um, how to safely go about exercise and strength training and the precautions. Um, I just wondered what you can tell me about the FlexiTouch machine, or it's some kind of system that helps to increase the lymphatic flow. Can you give me information about it or explain it better? I'm not even sure what the machine is supposed to do. I mean, there's a machine, so. There is. Um, I'm familiar with the FlexiTouch. It is something that I've had to, I've recommended to some of my patients, depending on what's going on. The purpose of the FlexiTouch, and there are a bunch of pneumatic compression pumps out there. So um, there's a variety of things, depending on what's going on with you and making sure it's the right one for you. I just want to even, because none of us really see you to know exactly what's going on but the flexi touch is something that is one of them it's probably my favorite of the group really only because it does address the trunk where some of the other ones don't and so with the flexi touch pump it does have multiple pieces and it there i think there's a trunk piece where when you're doing your diaphragmatic breathing it's stimulates all of your inguinal and axillary lymph nodes. It even comes across the chest in order to try and maintain anastomoses. And it really works best, all of the pumps work best with treatment. So you want, there's nothing like the hands-on MLD to get your system going the way it's supposed to be going. But the purpose of the pumps are to give you extra treatment and to help just boost your system further to try and keep things moving the way the therapist is trying to get them moving. And sometimes with um, like a tactile sensitivity, if you're struggling with even having anybody touch you or just the skin is so sensitive that you can't manage to tolerate an MLD session, even you touching yourself, some people all have where it's like, it just hurts and I can't even touch it. I don't even wanna touch myself because it's just uncomfortable. The pump is a machine that sometimes helps to lessen that. It can get things moving, it's an option and just another modality that can be used to try and help get the fluid moving out of the place that it's congesting and causing pain and discomfort. In my mind's eye, who knew, you know, what this could even be? You, you go back to the Frankenstein movie and you think, what is this thing that's going to be, you know, and it doesn't sound like it's that at all. <laughs> well, it does. I mean, I do have patients who are like, they feel like the Michelin man or something in it because it's like <laughs> bulky and, but usually it does feel good and it should always be comfortable. Like none of them should ever cause pain or anything. And so I think that's the big thing with even any of the pumps, when you're utilizing the pumps, you shouldn't feel uncomfortable. It shouldn't be something that causes you pain or that you dread using. It should be something to supplement and make you feel better. So I've been diagnosed with lymphedema. So I have the glove and the sleeve and it was more I'm affecting my hand, so now I have some pain there and some numbness. So they did a nerve test, MRI. Long story short, they're um, hesitant to do like even a simple carpal tunnel release for fear of making my lymphedema worse. Is that like a real thing to like kind of be worried about? Or we do work with different surgeons. Actually, it's one of the things that has come up since we've opened our practice, and so we've been really interested to hear this different surgeons take on lymphedema sometimes it kind of falls into one of those gray areas that like there's pros and cons and they're experimenting with different things and it depends on which is worse um and improving your quality of life and making sure everything is good no one wants your lymphedema to get worse 
And what they're at least starting to do in our area with the different surgeons who are interested is you want to incorporate the lymphatic treatment into the surgery as much as possible and just kind of try and deal with both. So the goal with some of our surgeons has been they send them for lymphedema therapy before they go for surgery. They get the patient as low and as small as possible. So there's next to no swelling in the limb when they're actually doing the surgery. They do their surgery, they patch everything up, they start the surgical healing part of the whole process, but then you're getting back on your lymphedema therapy as soon as physiologically possible, doing your manual lymph drainage, doing your wrapping. They might even change you out of their compression into a lymphedema wrap sooner to manage the fluid, get all of the fluid moving. And we've had some pretty good outcomes. Now, I don't know where all of the research on this is. It's seems to still fall in that gray area where some of the surgeons do, some of the surgeons don't. It probably depends on how the lymphedema therapy is even surrounding the surgery, what exactly they're doing. And each individual case is very different too, depending on what your lymphedema looks like, what stage you're at before the surgery, after the surgery, that kind of stuff. There is the risk of it getting worse, but usually only if there's a complication or something. Um, If everything goes well, We've had some positive outcomes and you don't want to live your life in pain and immobile and suffering because of a possibility of making your lymphedema worse. If the lymphedema can be managed and you can get both of them taken care of and live your life and be able to move and do better. I don't know that that's the perfect answer, but a lot of this is kind of gray area. Yeah, no, thanks. That's really helpful. Can I just jump in just with Candace's answer? A, A, there is no perfect answer because everybody is different. So I'm with Candace there. Uh, The one thing I have seen is carpal tunnel is not an uncommon thing to develop with lymphedema. And and, um, so further to Candace's suggestion about getting the lymphedema as good as you can prior to surgery, sometimes that, that tingling actually goes away. Because the carpal tunnel, the nerve that, that passes in that, it's a very small space. And when we have lymphedema, swelling takes up space. So that small little tunnel becomes even smaller and the compression can be even greater on the nerve. So um, I'm not saying it's a miracle cure, but getting the lymphedema as well managed as you can, sometimes those symptoms go away and surgery isn't necessary at all. So I just wanted to add that in. Um, thanks so much. Hi, I'm Kathy, and I had a mastectomy six and a half weeks ago and was told, don't do anything except for these very mild PT exercises um, for six weeks. And so then, you know, I started to slowly ease back into regular life, and I definitely noticed my right arm, which is the side I had the mastectomy and the lymph node um, biopsy was swollen. And so I told my doctor. And anyway, I'm just wondering, like, am I overreacting? Was it just that I need to push back? Should I get a lymphedema um, evaluation? What should I expect from the lymphedema initial evaluation? And then, you know, if, if it's something I I get once, is it going to come back for the rest of my life? You know, at about this time at about um, just over six weeks post-op, if you're still experiencing swelling, I would get that checked out by a lymphedema therapist. Um, The first few weeks after any type of surgery, it's normal to have edema. At this point, um, I I would have it checked out by a certified lymphedema therapist. Um, So your first visit will be the evaluation. Um, So they're going to ask you about your history, about your, um, the surgery, um, you know, if if you had an axillary node dissection, sentinel node, if you've had radiation, what type of, um, you know, if you're on chemotherapy. Um, and then, you know, so the, they're going to take measurements of your arm, probably just like with a tape measure, they're going to feel your arm, um, you know, take a look also at your surgical site, uh, see if there's any scarring, see if there's any like pitting or, or dimpling in your skin. Um, you know, depending on the clinic, they may initiate treatment. A lot of times the first session is, you know, taking these measurements and your history and educating you about what, uh, what to expect during your sessions. Um, is it reversible? Uh, you know, when it's, when it's very mild stage one, it can be reversible, um, as, as it, um, If it's a later stage, stage two or stage three, where the swelling is more significant, it's not coming and going, um, then, you know, there's some more chronicity to it, Uh, but the earlier, the better. Um, One 
last burning question that I have that I think I saw from our Facebook group was acupuncture. I know a lot of us utilize acupuncture for um, remedying other ailments that are that we're suffering from. Is it advisable then that we shouldn't get acupuncture in the affected limb? I can try to pick this one. And so, cause I, I have, um, I'm certified in acupuncture as well as uh, dry needling. So I think the traditional answer is to be cautious. So, I mean, as we said before, there's lots we know, but there's lots we still don't know. So the, the, maybe the, the cautious answer is we can still be quite effective with acupuncture staying out of that affected body part or that affected quadrant. So I think ideally talking with your practitioner, uh, whoever that may be, I'm going to give you a but, and I feel like that's sort of the theme of our whole, yeah. <laughs> our whole talk this evening, um, is I'll be honest, um, acupuncture, I tend not to go into the limb because I feel like I can be effective elsewhere with dry needling or um, with, it's also called, uh, I, um, oh my goodness, I can't think of the name right now. Nonetheless, the dry needling is a different technique. It's using acupuncture needles, but it's going into to tight areas of the body or trying to stimulate certain nerves. So it's very anatomical, it's very, very different. Um, I dry needle in the affected quadrant all the time, mm. all the time. Um, and, and the reason is because what I'm working on, when I'm using it with this population, is getting into muscles that we just can't get to release, no matter how much your, my clients are stretching at home, no matter how much my fascial work, I'm working on them. We just can't, there's just some deep stuff. So then yes, I will kneel in, in the at-risk side. However, I always have a very educated conversation with my clients first and say, look, there's risks and there's potential benefits. And, and we talk about the risk to benefit because if things are tight, then we probably get lymphatic flowing better so there's probably some good benefits. So at the end of the day, it's my, it's your, it's your choice. It's your choice, just understanding what the risks and what the benefits are um, as, as you move forward. Thank you everyone for joining us. It's been lovely seeing your faces and I hope you will tune in. Um, every other Sunday, we host webinars on a variety of topics that you can check out at survivingbreastcancer.org forward slash events. Mm -hmm.